everybody. God bless you today. Yeah. All right, have your seats. Have your seats. What a blessing. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord with you one more time. I don't know about you, but I'm just glad to be alive. Amen. Glad to experience the goodness and the grace of the Lord in the land of the living. And certainly we're so blessed that you are all here. You could be so many different places this morning. But for you to be in worship with us today, we want to just appreciate and acknowledge that uh, it is indeed a great blessing to be in the house of God with all you, the people of the way. This show, uh, certainly we want to welcome everybody that's watching us online. Let's thank God for all of our uh, The Way is Everywhere folks watching online. Today, as you can imagine, all across the country, we are doing some cool partnering with congregations to highlight the issues of gun violence in our communities. Um, all across the country, we got tons of folks who are uh, this whole week going to be spending uh, a good chunk of their time trying to persuade all of our uh, elected officials and decision makers to take uh, some very uh, aggressive and common sense steps to make sure that our communities are not overwhelmed by violence that is a result of lethal weapons uh, proliferating in our communities. And so because we are all followers of Jesus, who is a peacemaker, somebody say amen, who is someone who calls us to live in peace with one another, we thought that we spend a few moments, uh, as we often do here, uh, just highlighting some of the many ways and the impacts that violence has on our communities. And so uh, I'm certainly going to invite a couple folks to come and join me on stage and help us talk a little bit about how this impacts our communities and our loved ones. And then we're going to have a special performance by Soul Development before it's all over. Amen. And, uh, you know, uh, they're directly impacted by uh, many of these issues as well. And, uh, and uh, certainly I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you all good uh, creating peacemaker sermon. And uh, hopefully we'll take some concrete action on these matters. So I'm going to invite uh, Madeline, amen, to join me, us on stage. She is one of our co-leaders of our justice ministry and also uh, a good, a good, uh, wonderful educator at the Rosa Concrete School. And then I'm going to ask Sister Melina, who's one of our young people, to come and join us on stage as well. And she has been uh, helping us to uh, do all kind of great uh, work over the years. Good morning, The Way. Um, let me just first say that I'm so grateful for this, for this community. Um, as an educator, as a teacher, you know this is trying work. Um, this is not, you tends to be not sustainable work uh, for many of us, especially educators of color. So this particular space um, really makes it sustainable spiritually, mentally, socially, emotionally. Yeah. Um, so I'm grateful for this community. My name is Mari Ling. I am a second grade teacher at Roses and Concrete Community School. My fam's right up here. Hi, everybody. My name is Melana King. Um, Melina for the Latinos in here, but um, I was a student at Berkeley Tech. For those of you who don't know, that is the continuation school in Berkeley. Um, and I will talk about a couple things when we get to it. Yeah, clap it up for them, everybody. I want to appreciate it. So, so this issue of gun violence, certainly, and issues of violence in general in our communities are often seen through a lens, particularly nationally, um, of mass shootings. And often when mass shootings happen, um, the whole world tends to stop. Not every time mass shooting, but certainly when mass shootings happen in elementary schools or high schools or movie uh, spaces. Um, and there's all kinds of conversations about how and what we need to do to address these issues among our young people. I'd just love for you, Madeline, since you are an educator in an elementary school, just to talk a little bit about um, the young people in your uh, school and the families that you all serve at Roses and Concrete, and how does gun violence impact them on a regular basis? Um, so there tends to be this myth that elementary students um, aren't developmentally ready to talk about these issues of violence in their community, um, that they're too young to understand it and process it, that they're too young to be critical thinkers around these issues in their community, which is completely not true. Um, actually, that's precisely why I got into education, because um, I saw violence in different ways when I was really young, and I didn't have the um, ability or skill set to articulate what was actually going on um, to those around me and to those who I love. 
And so that's why I got into elementary education because there tends to be this idea that only high schoolers are ready to talk about these things or only middle schoolers are ready to talk about these things. But um, Dr. Bettina, Dr. Bettina Love, um, who is at the University of Georgia, if you're not familiar with her work, get privy to her work, she's dope. Um, but she talks a lot about this idea that um, these charter schools and even uh, public schools tend to push for the development of character in our elementary kids. And she talks about how there's this push for elementary kids to be critical thinkers and to be problem solvers. And she says, well, as indigenous folk, as black and brown folk, waking up in the morning is problem solving skills, right? Waking up and walking to school in the morning as a third grader by yourself, having to see all this violence in your community and walking through your classroom door ready to learn you are a problem solver and you are a critical thinker naturally, right? It's like a nat you're a natural born leader. And so she talks and speaks of this in ways that we really have to address as educators. Um, you know, our babies are carrying a lot of trauma on their shoulders um, and to not address it and to not actually um, have and hold a space for healing and hope um, is actually doing them, not, do, not just doing them a disservice, but um, not acknowledging their humanity and what they're living every day. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'll go to you real quick, Melina, because I know um, certainly there is uh, a lot of um, stories that you can share around how um, this, these issues of violence and trauma have impacted you and your family um, and our communities, the communities in which uh, you live. Talk a little bit just about what you've had to do to learn to cope, and I don't know um, necessarily um, how comfortable you feel sharing um, some of some of the incidences or the number of incidents that you've had to deal with, but you are a young person, you're 18 years old, and you, you're one of our stars, thank God, uh, that have, have been able to navigate this, uh, these, these landmines. But talk a little bit just about your experience around how these issues impact you. Um. First of all, I'm from East Oakland, was raised in East Oakland, so definitely, yeah, definitely um, seen a lot of violence over there. Um, I wanna talk about um, what things cause violence, right? So in the hood, where is there a corner store? There is not any nourishment for our babies, for anybody going to the corner store for breakfast in the morning, lunch, whatever it is. When I went to B Tech, the only store that was in front of us was the corner store, and they didn't have peanuts, they didn't have nuts, fruits, anything, just chips, soda, candy, that's it. And wouldn't you think that malnourishment would make you feel angry, make you feel a little tense all the time, make you unclear? So that's one thing I would like to show when people are too quick to hop on, well, black on black crime, da 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 No, 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 we're not talking about that. We're talking about what you put in our babies to make them feel like they gotta do stuff. Um, but also, growing up abused by my brother, just growing up very um, around violence, and nobody stopping it for me, me learning how to stop it myself, um, was a little hard. I think that we need healing places for the younger people. Like she said, we need healing places in the schools, um, circles, places that we can talk about those things and we feel comfortable talking about it because kids need to let it out at the end of the day. When, when yeah, clap it up for that for sure. When, when we, when you were in, in high school, uh, and uh, certainly even now as you are getting ready to head to college real soon, hopefully, thank God, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, um, there was often this sense that there weren't a lot of uh, healers or counselors uh, that were readily available um, to help you all deal with some of the violence and the trauma that you all were dealing with. Can you just talk a little bit about your experience around in, in your school, would you wish there were more counselors? Do you wish there were more opportunities for healing? You've mentioned that a little bit, but maybe just expound on that a little bit more. Um, well, the first two years of high school, I went to Berkeley High School, and it felt like 
there wasn't really any type of healing. It was like, oh, you're feeling down, go to the health center and speak with the therapist. But what do I look like talking to a white man about what I'm going through and my struggle? <laughs> so that was the... You wish there were more therapists of color, people that Yeah, had people of color just inside of the healing spaces because people don't understand that you want to talk to somebody who you're comfortable with, who you can relate to. Mm. Um, because if you're talking to somebody and it feels like they don't understand where you're coming from or your struggle, your past, you don't want to talk to them and you get agitated. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely more people of color in healing spaces in schools. Yes, yes. Madeline, ju jump in here, because as an educator, I know that uh, Roses and Concrete and many of you all are, it's a, it's a majority person of color space, if it seems like it. When you walk on campus, it feels like you in Wakanda in some. some it is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk a little bit about um, what you all have done. Uh, I know there were some walkouts that happened this week. Yep. Uh, did anybody walk out this week? Anybody? A few folks. All right. All right. I see a few of y'all with your hands up. Um, talk a little bit about just what uh, you all did on campus and, and just in general, what do you think we need to be thinking about? Because right now they're talking about arming teachers. This is like one of the best proposals that comes out of the White House, um, which shows you the, the how low a bar of intellectual uh, inquiry and th thinking is happening. Would you want to be armed? Is that something you're, you're hoping for as an educator? <laughs> I don't know. It's just an open-ended question. I'd love to hear your response. I'm going to address that one first. That's an easy no. <laughs> um, no, teachers do not need to be strapped with guns. Amen. Uh, we need to be strapped with more resources, right? Yes. And there's this, been, um, there's, this, there's this meme that's been going around um, that says just that, right? Like, don't strap teachers with guns, strap them with more pencils, right? Because we can't even get that in our classrooms. Um, but, you know, Roses in Concrete is not an exception to the lack of resources in our community, right? Um, so Roses in Concrete also, too, we have our struggles with um, not enough therapists, not enough counselors, um, but I think the work being done at Roses, what makes it so unique is that we are predominantly educators of color teaching black and brown babies, but we also um, are using our best um, wealth in community uh, to tap into the resources that are already in our families, that are already in our babies, that are already in our community in East Oakland. And so, um, you know, we're not trained therapists, but a lot of times as educators at Roses, we have to be therapists, mm -hmm. right? And we have to play that role of helping heal our families, helping heal our children, but it goes way beyond the individual. We actually have to uh, provide skill sets for families to also do that work, mm -hmm. right, themselves. And so not enabling parents and being like, come to me for help, let me be your healer, but also showing them skill sets of how to help their babies heal and how to approach healing in their homes and how to have circles, restorative circles in their own homes because parents can do it right yes. and a lot of parents are already doing it and so it's just a matter of bringing community in and making sure that we're tapping into all those resources that are already there right because um, there's not a lack of resources in our communities there's mm. so much wealth in our communities that we're just not tapping into yes 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 well I I, I want to appreciate both of you um, in the in the work that you all are doing and certainly I think it is quite an inspiration uh, for all of us to make sure that we are doing what we can, both as younger people. I guess you're still a young person. I'm not as young as I used to be. Oh, okay. To the wealth of our communities. Uh, this Saturday, we are having books and breakfast, uh, and it's a monthly program that the Justice and Mercy Ministry does. Um, but at books and breakfast, we're actually going to have the author of Cultura y Buenestar, and they actually taught. It's five authors from Oakland. They're Bay Area authors, mm. and they talk about tapping into. Um, uh, natural healing, natural ways of healing, herbal healings, um, drumming as healing, and we're actually going to do a children's workshop on drumming as healing as well, so we'll have some teachers here to do that. So please come. Good. Yes, clap it up for them, everybody. <laughs> Y'all, go ahead, leave your mics. I see a couple folks I want to bring up who, who just walked in. Uh, there are some of our elected official and folks who are, who are here. I see Stevan Cook. 
I want you to come on stage, bro. You, you, uh, he's a, he's the uh, school board member for the city of San Francisco school district. He's a member of the way, and I'm gonna put him on the spot. And then we have uh, our dear, uh, dear uh, sister um, Pamela Price, who is actually uh, running to be the district attorney. Amen. Right there, real quick. Now, this isn't a campaign stop. I just want to let you know that. But I love to get y'all's thoughts on. Um, so, some of these issues. So quickly, just introduce yourself real quick. And I, I know I'm just throwing y'all on the spot, but this is what we do with the way. Yeah, my name is Steve Ann Cook. I'm, I'm the vice president of San Francisco Board of Education. I was elected in November of 2016. Clap it up for my man, our fellow. Yeah, yeah. My name is Pamela Price, and I'm going to be your next Alameda County District Attorney. All right. <laughs> now. As a, someone who for sure is um, working to, as an elected official to make sure our schools are not only safe uh, from um, the kind of violence that is inflicted on the bodies of folks, but also the minds, talk a little bit about what this climate of both youth activism and issues around school safety, how are you thinking about this as an as a elected official and what would you say to all of us as a congregation who are in many respects kind of trying to figure out some of the same things? Well, you know, mo moments like this are really, um, they reveal a lot about the resilience and the, the passion and um, the capacity of our young people to organize themselves and, and create um, and to speak to issues that are affecting them in a very real way. You know, a the students that we have in San Francisco were really at the forefront um, of, of uh, pushing to, to make sure that these things are addressed immediately with urgency and with um, as if their lives were at stake. Yeah. And so we, we tend to try to do things a lot on behalf of young people, but when you really, when they really rise to the occasion, it's like, it's, it's incredibly inspiring. And uh, the urgency that we all feel around safety is something that is shaking all of us, but they're rising to the occasion, they're pushing in ways that um, are really impressive. And so at times like this, we're really actually like, supporting them and taking their lead mm -hmm. and, and hearing from them what they want to see happen, what type of safety measures they want to see. Like as, as a commissioner, every Friday morning I visit school sites. Mm -hmm. And it, it really was kind of um, interesting to me how easy it is to kind of walk in and out of a school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and it, you know, as a young black man, when I'm going into a school site and I'm thinking, oh, am I gonna get stopped just because that's already on my mind? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I can just walk in um, and there's, you know, some, some school sites have better safety procedures than others, but the ones that actually are the higher performing ones are the ones that are a bit more open, mm. right? And the ones that are a bit more locked down or, or that way because um, they may have parent disputes. So this is like a little like, you know, things happen in lower income communities where people kind of get at each other or whatever, so schools tend to be a little more on safety alert. but. As a result of this, all of our school sites are um, doing a much better job of just monitoring who's coming in and out. And um, so that's one of the, the, uh, the things that I noticed and one of the things that we're addressing is making sure that schools just have better safety precautions about who can come in and who can exit a building. Mm -hmm. Sis Pam, why don't we bring you in real quick. As someone who is well aware of how the criminal justice system works, can you talk? about how violence <coughs> is um, being addressed in our communities through the criminal justice system and how can we reimagine public safety um, in the context of not only gun violence but all forms of violence that happen. Because in our communities, when we talk about gun violence, we have to also have to talk about police violence, we have to talk about uh, domestic violence, we have to talk about suicide, we have to talk about the whole spectrum of violence and not just focus on one form of the manifestation of violence, amen, because it does kind of bear itself out. So talk a little bit about some of your thoughts on that and um, love to hear your, your opinions. So it's very much in sync with what you just said. We have to have a holistic view about how we address violence in our communities, in our schools, in our homes, how we address violence throughout this country. I mean, we all know that violence is unfortunately part of the American experience. This is a country that was based on violence. Mm -hmm. 
uh, built on violence. And so the prevalence of guns and the whole reliance around the Second Amendment, we gotta have guns everywhere. People in the world don't have guns like we do. And so we have to address that and, and acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge that we incarcerate 25% of the world, of our people, and we're only less than 5% of, of the world's population. And so there's a reason for that. And so we do have to look at not just domestic violence and, and focus on how we address domestic violence. We gotta look at the whole family. It affects everybody. And what, what triggers that not that it's excusable, but it's the fact of our lives and the trauma that we're dealing with in our lives from children, as I heard the sisters talking about, and our children are traumatized. The whole community is traumatized anytime somebody gets shot. It don't have to be a mass shooting. <laughs> Just a child on the street, to me, is trauma. And we're all living with that, and we haven't addressed that. So I see the role of the criminal justice system. We have to revamp the whole thing. Mm -hmm and what exactly come up with a holistic way of dealing with it you know the family violence justice center needs to be expanded mm -hmm. to talk about how violence is affecting all of us and what anger does to us you know we get so angry about stuff and we don't have an outlet for that and we know black people are constantly in a state of rage so how do we manage that okay for real well, y'all better not be in no rage up in here today, praise <laughs> God. You know, you can, you, no. Um, well, I, I, I appreciate y'all coming on, coming on stage real quick. Any final, final thoughts you, you'd like to say before we? Yeah, as I was thinking about my initial response to it, it made me just wonder, how many people have school-aged children in the audience or work in education with school-aged children? All right, it's, it'd be helpful just for your own school site, the schools that you send your kids to hear from them, what is their exit and entrance procedure at their school and notice just you know how easy it is to, to come in or, or leave a site um, because yeah guns aren't, aren't really going anywhere like if being on the board of education one of the things that I oversee is expulsion proceedings and so every time a kid gets expelled uh, we have to vote on whether or not they should or shouldn't be expelled and a lot of the things that come up are um, kids that have guns at school mm -hmm. and, and that's like an automatic expulsion mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, guns are around, uh, and they're in places where you may not expect them, like schools that are doing the best and schools that are struggling. But that's one sort of common thing you can ask your school site. You know, how are you guys thinking about who's coming in, who's exiting the building, um, who's making that policy? What are ways that we can make sure that you know our school is constantly safe? Yeah, safe? and we'll we'll spend some time, um, not just today, but moving forward, talking about these issues more deeply because as we worked in our schools, um, we realized that a lot of our young folks were carrying weapons or there was a community gun that was in the bushes somewhere um, because people don't feel safe, right. right? And a lot of our young people are walking back and forth to schools in war zones, government sanctioned war zones. And when we can't trust or have confidence that the police are gonna actually provide safety to a lot of our children, then children resort to their own methods and so again, all of us have to be peacemakers. All of us have to figure out how are we creating conditions um, where our young people and our families do not resort to this kind of, of activity and behavior. And I think um, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about some concrete things that we can do that are action steps to actually expand and make this possible. Let's thank God for our panel and our, our loved ones that were here today. Yeah, yeah, what's yes, that? Na 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 We say uh our father try to pray for peace but every day is getting harder can't even scroll my phone without somebody getting slaughtered And even with the cameras up, no charges being brought up They body slam my daughters and they execute our fathers Make us pray for peace because of what the past has taught us Never trust they police because of what the past has taught us They lawless and they heartless They evil and they godless This is holy war regardless And it's evident I'm militant But that don't mean I'm violent Contrary to your rights, it ain't right to remain silent Now when all our kids are dying 
Somebody gotta fight to protect what's right. So when faced with violence, fighting's what you do to protect your life. And I can't keep quiet. We can't keep on marching to rallies and have another riot. Try to boycott, but silly people are still buying. Bullets is still flying. Brothers is still dying. Yo, military mind state, organize the village. Respect, protect our women, form a circle around our children. Elders at the center, we rely upon their wisdom. Guidance and their counsel, show them honor while they living. A brother can't do much from in the grave or in the prison. Think he's free and really slave to the system. Victor or a villain, I refuse to play the victim. See, my sisters ain't no witch. My brothers die from triggers first. We edify the language, then unify the gangs. Separate our differences. We banging for the same thing as ghetto scriptures. Encoded it in slang. First, I put it in the music, then I put it on your brain. I teach them how to use it. I show them where to aim. I pull it to the side, then I put them up on game. We give them food for thought and let it stimulate the brain. We can build the nation up or tear a devil out the frame. Bang, can't you see that we under attack? They shooting us in our backs. No knife for the gunfight in San Francisco just taught us that. We can't run forever cause Walter Scott had just taught us that. Hands up, I can't breathe. Look how they choked that man. A black life is worth more than a hashtag. More than a picket sign. We living in wicked times. We can't call the cops on the cops when the cops committing crimes. No indictment for their killers till them not one dime. Yo, riots and rallies ain't. The iceberg is always bigger than the tip trip. Found guilty by a jury of six witches. A dead man took the stand as his own witness. This is the America I live in. Where killers they roam free and the victims go to prison. But we was born in prison, been living in poor conditions. So death is your sentence and your skin is your conviction. I realize from the trial we ain't winning. I realize we alive, we ain't living. Spend a lifetime trying to break a broken system on our knees, pleading, begging, praying, hoping, and wishing. Please, I ain't signing no petition. I take a new position, trying to break a broken system. Until it's broke and won't work for nobody. If it don't work for everybody, can't work for anybody. Cause so say that Panther Party. Fred Hampton, Dr. King, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, and yours truly, screaming 50 slugs for moody people. Love is our duty, but we got to have unity. Fortify the families and build stronger communities. Educate our children, afford them with opportunities. Show them how to love black before they reach puberty. Cause knowledge itself gives them immunity. I said, knowledge itself give them immunity. I said, knowledge itself give them immunity. I said, knowledge itself give them immunity. We say, 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 no, 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 no,
And it was at that time I said that um, truth is we all one bullet away from being a hashtag. But what was ill, I was able to type, I didn't type it, BJ did, but type my brother's death date. And it didn't sting. And it didn't take me under. And anger and retaliation didn't visit me the way they used to. And I realized how often our young people live under the spirit of offense and with these wounds and what could be the outcome. It has to be cataclysmic. It has to be because where is grace, where is mercy in their healing? So we have to bring them to spaces like this and take them to spaces beyond to really introduce grace and mercy and healing because the policies don't fix what's going on in the heart. So we can have a bunch of political conversations and it can still get cracking that easy. It isn't until we dress the place where the wound was caused and we call that place well and we speak the word of God over the wound. When you want to lift, you can't just lift from the, from, from, from the top where it's convenient or who can reach you. You got to lift from the bottom. The least of us, the left out and the looked over. That's what soul development intends and holds to reach. The way we love you and we bless you for real. A place that I can come and pronounce my brother's life in light of Christ and remove the spirit of offense that once haunted me. That would have taken this song and never would have become. It would have been another jail song behind bars. To God be the glory. Come on, y'all, put your hands together. And uh, certainly there are a couple things that we believe you and I can do to make every effort to reduce uh, the conditions that make violence possible in our communities. And so uh, we hope that you will uh, participate with us and imagine that there are things we can do. Somebody say, I can do something, amen. Amen, and together we can make this reality shift in Jesus' name. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter number 60. I think that says 6, but it should be 60. Isaiah chapter number 60, it will be on the screen, um, but I'm sure that's supposed to say 60. Isaiah chapter 60 is where we're coming from. And uh, it's a very, I think, uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture uh, that come up for us as we are thinking and talking about how we as people of faith uh, are to respond in these seasons and in these moments. Uh, the book of Isaiah uh, is one of these uh, major prophets and the prophet's role, particularly to the children of Israel, is to call them back into right living and right relationship with God and with the people and with the land. And uh, often, uh, how many of you know you can be uh, following uh, God for a little while, and you can forget what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, or you can just ignore what you're supposed to be doing. Some say, no, Pastor, I'm just forgetful. Amen. I'm not, I would not dare ignore what God has asked me to do. Or some of you, we can just be honest and say, we just rebel against what God's telling us to do. Do I got any rebellious folk in the house? All right, thank God for that one or two, three. Thank God. Amen. We, we don't want to be lying in church, amen. If there's any place you should tell the truth, somebody say it should be the church, amen. So, so uh, Isaiah and the prophets are always here to help redirect us and put us back into right relationship. Let's see what the scripture says to us. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 through 2. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and God's glory will appear over you. Jump down to verse number 17. The second part of verse 17 says, And I will appoint peace as your overseer, and righteousness or justice as your taskmaster. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your wall salvation and your gates praise. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Yeah, so we'll spend this uh, next few moments just talking about um, be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Bow your heads with me. Let's 
ask for the blessings of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you and send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word, and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. May give your neighbor a high five and tell him, be a peacemaker, please. Be a peacemaker. Uh, Better yet, why don't you pat yourself on the chest and say, I am a peacemaker. Now, it is indeed the case as we uh, follow Jesus, and if we take the words of Jesus seriously, Jesus declares that blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. This idea that being a child of God must be equal or uh, in alignment in alignment with being a peacemaker should not be up for debate. But somehow we have figured out a practice of Christian faith in the Western world, particularly here in the United States where you can be a follower of Jesus and be a warmonger. You can be a follower of Jesus and be someone who can really make a lot of sense out of violence. You can be a follower of Jesus in, in these United States of America and not feel any sort of tension between the many ways in which our tax dollars or even our own personal dollars are often spent more on the idea of protection through violence than safety through not only investment but relationship with one another. I find it so fascinating that uh, we are a people who can claim to follow Jesus but yet do much of the opposite of what Jesus did. I'll say, Pastor, I can't do what Jesus did. He was Jesus. Okay, can you at least do what Jesus said? Amen. Like you know, I mean, I I I I admit, walking on water that's kind of a high bar. Healing the sick oh, on a good day, you know, maybe maybe you can channel that. Raising the dead, Amen. If if that's if you if you there, then we definitely need you to go to St. Jude's and Children's Hospital and other places and go to cemetery and bring some folk back. Amen. I, I admit you may not be able to do everything Jesus did, but could you at least struggle and wrestle to do what Jesus said? Now, again, I'm not talking to everybody, amen, because we are here at a Jesus Church. Touch your name, amen. If I was out talking in a a multi-faith or agnostic space, I would rely on, you know, just kind of some common secular humanistic principles of peace, love, and justice. But since we are at church, I think I'm at church. Touch your neighbor, right? I can, t- I can talk about Jesus. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them we can talk about Jesus up in here. Amen. It's, Jesus all right up in here. He all right with me. He all right with you. But it's so critical for you and I to appreciate that how we talk about Jesus, how we follow Jesus has great impact on the kind of world and community we are stewarding as an act of faithfulness to God. Because you cannot be a follower of Jesus and be totally out to lunch and un, 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 uh, uh, pre, uh, with, without being preoccupied with what's happening around us. Uh, Just this week, I continue to be real thoughtful about all the many ways that we are being invited into the work of God in the world against a backdrop that reminds us that evil is real. Evil is real. I was uh, uh, down at South by Southwest actually last week and 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 so you know I was a little uh, attuned with Austin Texas and just had left and some of my friends we were hanging out there etc and then I heard this week about the bombs that were going off uh, three bombs in the last couple of weeks where one young man a 17 year old uh, a bassist uh, a honor student 
was killed by a bomb placed uh, on, uh, in his home or on his steps. And it turned out there were three bombs that were mailed to prominent African-American and Latino folks in the neighborhoods of Austin. And for many of us, you, you may not have heard that much about it because for some reason that wasn't newsworthy. That we have folk mailing bombs to our loved ones. I was certainly uh, alarmed and continue to be alarmed by all of the, the foolishness that breaks through the national narrative and conversation but always continue to be reminded that every day in our communities, we have violence at levels of mass shootings. That we have shootings and acts of violence that overwhelm our communities and our families. And you could be living your life with the best intention and find tragedy knocking on your front door without your invitation. And so for you and I, we have to also be people who can have a right kind of analysis around what is going on where we are and within the culture in which we live. Because quiet as it's kept, perhaps the reason why we have such a violent culture is because we are a part of a state, a nation that depends on violence in order to try and create some semblance of peace. And how is it that we can be so wedded to a way of life that depends on violence in order to create peace without us being a witness or at least bearing witness that there is another way of life that does not depend on violence in order to create peace? That as a follower of Jesus, peace should be our lifestyle, not a means to an end. Peace should be something and a way of life where you and I are called consistently into imagining how can I allow my faithfulness to the ways of Jesus to create peace in my life and certainly around all that I touch. I'm, I'm compelled by St. Francis of Assisi's uh, prayer. It's a prayer attributed to St. Francis. Uh, many folk are, are now starting to realize he maybe didn't write it, amen, uh, because uh, it appeared in, I think, the early 1900s. But, you know, when stuff sticks, it just sticks, say praise God. And so we just going to call it the prayer of Assisi today, but just know it may have been uh, written maybe 600 years after he died, so unless he came back, praise God. He didn't write it, but we still gonna call it the Francis, uh, St. Francis prayer. Uh, put, put it up on the screen if you don't mind. I don't know if you'll be able to, to read this, but I love where it says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy, O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. The lifestyle of a peacemaker is someone who appreciates and fully grasps that the way to peace cannot be done with the tools and the philosophies of violence. And you and I have to be very clear as followers of Jesus in a violent world, how we are to posture ourselves. Otherwise, we may very well become an agent of death in a way that gets us further away from what and who we are called to be as children of God. And I don't know about you, but 
there is never a moment in my life where I want to be going further away from God's call to be a peacemaker. Now, admittedly, it's hard to make peace with some folk. Somebody say amen. 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 It's like, Pastor, I appreciate what you're saying. Amen. We here at church. Amen. And, and, you know, I'm looking around the room, and I don't think I got too many enemies up in here, so this sounds about right. But you don't know the people on my job. You don't know the people in my school. You don't know the people in my neighborhood. You certainly don't even know the people in my house. Touch your neighbor. Amen. How many of you know that you can't be a child of God part-timing? You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a part-time child. I'm a child of God on Sunday when I'm at church. But when I'm at home, then it's, you know, it's, 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 it's an it's a act of convenience. As people tell me, you know, I had to put my Holy Ghost on the shelf uh, to, while I was at work today because this person had it coming. And after I, after I did that, I, I took the Holy Ghost back off the shelf. And me and me, me and I said, wow, you, you and the Holy Ghost got that kind of relationship, huh? <laughs> I, thought, I thought the Holy Ghost was in you, amen. You wear the Holy Ghost like a coat, praise God. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him you better make sure the spirit is in you. It's got to be in you. And, and, and when you find yourself filled with the spirit of peace, how many know it's easier for it to come out when you get squeezed? Mm-hmm. See, when, when the pressure is on, we get to find out what's in all of us. Amen. Amen. So, you know, a lot of us, you know, when ain't no pressure, we, oh, we going to talk about what we going to do. Oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then when the pressure hits, you start to realize, man, that's inside of me, huh? Ooh. Where's the prayer meeting? I need a prayer meeting up in here. I need a... I, where's the, where, I need a priest to confess. I, I, need, I need a Bible study because there are things inside of me that the pressure is pushing out. And I want to submit to you, child of God, that if we are going to be faithful in this moment, we must fill ourselves with things that make for peace. We have to fill ourselves. With things that make freeze. We have to be people who are willing to act in ways that allow peace to be the, 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 the driver of our lives. Not the, 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 the passengers. And I, I know some of us, you know, we got a lot of passengers in our car. And it depends on who you know what the circumstance is i got i got i got i got a, a, a the the mouth of a sailor in my car praise god i got my 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 revenge in the car i got my my anger fear and pain in the car and then you know uh i i, I got jesus there when jesus can fit you know But how many of you know that some of us need to stop our car and let some passengers out? So it leads me to my first point. What does it look like for you and I to be people who are characterized by peace? The first thing you and I have to begin to do is resist the darkness. Somebody say resist the darkness. Verse number two says, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the peoples. The text makes it clear that darkness covering the earth and the people is something that you and I must be actively resisting. Now, I'm sensitive to the way language is used over time and, and how it subconsciously can serve as a proxy for feelings and attitudes. And so I need you and I to be clear that when we're talking about darkness, we're not talking about the melanin in your skin. We're not talking about the negative association that, that dark bodies are often inherently having to push back against as a problem. The prophet is not speaking to the ideological assumptions of human hierarchy or white supremacy when he talks about darkness in the text, but rather he's talking about spiritual and moral decay that create distance from faithful living. 
The writer wants you and I to appreciate that there is a case and a sense in which darkness is covering the face of the earth and that darkness is simply defined as deception. That for many of us, darkness is a, a form of deception that clouds our ability to see rightly what we are called to do. Uh, and, and, and if you and I are not careful, we can become people who are moving more out of deception than out of truth. Out of deception than out of what we know to be right. And it is so clear in these moments that we can see how deception has clearly gripped our culture. Because there are people who would agree that it is more, uh, you know, uh, safe for me to have weapons in my home when all of the research tells you that the weapon in your home will more likely hurt you than the person you are trying to defend yourself from. Uh, there's all kind of interesting science that talks about how we are deceived by our own kinds of conscious and subconscious attitudes and predispositions about who is worthy and who is valuable. And, and because we do not tap into the light that actually peels away our deceptions, we'll spend lots of time acting out deceptive things rather than leaning into those things that speak truthfully to the reality of who and what we are called to be. I, I like how Frederick Douglass talks about deception when he talks about the Christianity of America. He says that I love the pure and peaceable and impartial Christianity of Christ. He goes on to say, I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's up there. He says, indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. Uh, somebody holler deception. You see, what you and I have to appreciate is that there's all kinds of deceptions that are masking themselves as faithfulness to God. And if you and I are not careful, we will find ourselves bumbling around in the dark when God has called you and I to live in the light. Somebody shout hallelujah. I don't mean to mess with y'all, but you know that when you got in that relationship, you were deceived. Uh huh. When, when, when you were puff puffing and passing, uh, you were deceived. Uh, uh, that shopping and that consumerism and that misogyny and that player player attitude, somebody holler, deception. Uh, uh, but God is calling for you today to step out into the light uh, and become someone who is defined not by the darkness that is deceiving us, but the light of God that is seeking to set us free. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so this is the, uh, one of the questions that I want you to appreciate. Where is the darkness of deception creating blind spots in your life? How does this darkness of deception Efface our collective and individual humanity. Because you and I must appreciate that you cannot live in darkness and deception and reach your full humanity. God wants to set us free from false truths, from misnomers from ideas that are incapable of producing the outcomes we want to see. What is it then that you have to do to make sure that you are driving the darkness away? That you are resisting this darkness. You are resisting the truths or the half-truths of this culture that will tell you the only way for you to be powerful is to oppress. The 
only way for you to be wealthy is to cheat and steal. The only way for you to be happy is to get a lot of things. The only way for you to be safe is to have more guns, more weapons. That is not the way of Jesus. And as we are in our final few weeks of Lent, child of God, you got to keep reminding yourself that Jesus could have came to save the world a totally different way. Amen. Jesus told the man, listen, I could call all these angels now. Don't get it twisted. Because y'all getting on my nerves up in here. But God so loved the world. How many know when you love something, you won't destroy it? You'll figure out a whole lot of other ways to preserve what you love. How many know the problem with Lord, have mercy, the churches, we have fallen out of love with God's creation. And the problem with many of us is we've fallen out of love with each other. So we use labels to describe each other rather than the love that is supposed to deeply inform our interactions with one another. Love will cast out darkness, but you gotta start resisting the darkness. Second thing the scripture, amen, lifts up that I think is worthy of our consideration is we have to walk into the light. So if you're resisting darkness, you have to learn to walk into the light. We sing a song, back. somebody say walk in the light. Say, we, we used to sing a song that said walk in the light. Y'all know that song? Beautiful light. Come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright shine all around us by day and by night jesus the light of the world whoa come let's walk in you know, that was a good song that was a good song back in the day boy how many know that we're not doing a lot of walking in the light anymore some of us some of us are more preoccupied with being powerful than being people of light. Some of us are more preoccupied with all other kind of things than being people of light. But I love in the scripture it says that I will appoint peace as your overseer and justice as your taskmaster. Ooh, them some tough words. I know some of us like, I'm free. I don't got no overseer and I don't got no taskmaster. That you know of. Because how many of you know that a lot of us got chains and got masters that run our life and we just not even aware of? I'd rather be conscious of who I'm called to follow than be deceived about who's leading me. I know we live in a time and an era where everybody is their own leader. But, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, if you just thought a little deeply about it, uh, there are all kind of things that guide our lives that are unconscious to us. And sometimes you need someone to shine the light. You need to walk into the light so you can become conscious of the things that are unconsciously leading you and I along. Theologically speaking and biblically speaking, the light will always bring us a revelation. It will always awaken us to something that may be dormant. And, and what I love about how the light of God works is that the light reveals itself often when there is a need in our lives. You know, Jürgen Boltman, he's a German theologian, one of my favorite pneumatologists. He says that where there is no need, there can be no revelation. And that for many of us, we are often missing out on the light of God because we are not clear about our needs from God. And we've been taught and we've been tricked to believe that we don't need anything from our God, that we can become very self sufficient and and we can make our own way but how many of you know that you making your own way will only get you so far 
Uh, I, 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 I like how, how the scripture, when it talks about the nexus of deliverance, when it talks about the ways in which God brings about transformation, that God always calls on us as individuals. He calls on us as a community. And then God calls on God's self to make up the difference. How many of you know that sometimes you can be dependent on yourself and you will fall short frequently? So you sure enough know you can be dependent on other people and you always fall short. But how many of you know even when you depend on yourself and when you depend on other people, there is still a gap that often needs the help of a power greater than you? And this is what it means to walk in the light. It means to walk intentionally in the direction where your gaps can be filled by the light of your God. Uh, where the gaps and the shortcomings you have uh, can be filled by the all-sufficiency of the creator who made you just how you are but said, I can always make you better. Uh, how many of you know you're looking for an upgrade today? Uh, God, I, I'm running off an old program, uh, and so God, I need an upgrade. Uh, Lord, I feel like preaching a little bit in here today. Uh, uh, last night I was working on my sermon uh, and, and, and my computer uh, popped up and it said, uh, would you like uh, uh, to install this upgrade? And I clicked the of course button uh, because I realized that my computer was running a little slow. But little did I know, another message showed up and said uh, that you must be connected to a power source. Uh, Lord, have mercy before this upgrade kicks in. I sat there at 2 in the morning and I almost started shouting. Uh, my wife looked over and said, you're making me nervous. I said, that's because I heard a word. At 2 in the morning, I was reminded that unless I am connected to a source, that the light of the God of our salvation will not shine as brightly as we may need it. So I'm here to tell you today, get connected to the source. Uh, don't you dare live your life uh, as if you don't need to be connected to a power greater than yourself. Uh, all the devil is alive. I must get connected. Uh, I must get connected to what God uh, has brought in my life. Uh, I must get connected to the power that God uh, has unleashed in my life. Uh, and when I can get connected, uh, how many of you know it's easier then uh, to be a peacemaker uh, because I don't rely on the power that is outside of me, uh, but I rely on the power that lives uh, on the inside. Uh, can somebody shout hallelujah? I dare you today uh, to make a decision uh, to get connected to the power source. Uh, I dare you today uh, to make a decision uh, to let your life uh, be so close to God uh, that when the enemy comes against you, uh, you are not moved by anger. Uh, you are not moved by fear. Uh, you will not resort to violence uh, because you know this uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that God will fight for me. Uh, God will protect me. Uh, God has my back. Uh, God will not allow me to be defeated. Uh, so if I'm losing right now, uh, it ain't nothing but a temporary setback uh, because God will bring victory and power. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. Get connected. Stay connected. And become a peacemaker. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is indeed the case, child of God, that all of us have limitations. We are not limitless people. We are created with limitations. That is what makes you human. 
but it is also what makes life so significant. Because every moment then becomes an opportunity. Every act becomes a gift. Every second becomes a window into the possibilities of who God has created us to be. If I had a little more time, I'd talk to you about how and what does it mean for the glory of God to shine through us. If I'm resisting the darkness and I'm walking into the light, God's glory shines through us. I remember watching Coming to America and <laughs> the brother had his soul glow. And whenever this brother sat down on a chair, he left residue. That glow <laughs> left residue wherever he went. Is the glory of God dripping off you enough? Hmm? That wherever you sit, soon as you leave, there's a residue of the glory. You walk in a room and you leave and there's a residue. You've shifted the atmosphere because the glory of God shining through you. I want to be so close to God in the peacemaking ways that any situation I walk into, even if we have to raise some tension to get to justice, the glory of God will be the residue. Come on, stand with me, everyone. Let's make a commitment. You are my peace, peace like no other, peace like no other, reaches to me, come on, you are. Peace like no other. Yeah, yeah. Peace like no other. Reaches, reaches to me. Come on, grab the hand of the person next to you. Say it again. You are my. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm holding a loved one and I'm praying that we can see peace manifesting in their lives. In a culture characterized by death and violence, may peace, Lord God, overwhelm them today. May peace be unleashed within them today. May salvation, may power, may your anointing. God, may it be unleashed within them so the darkness can be overwhelmed by the light. 
and the light, hallelujah, can unleash the glory of the Lord in our lives. Lift your hands right where you're standing. God, it's me, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister, nor is it my brother. But it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need your strength. I need your power. I need your anointing. And I need you, Lord, to do all that you are able to do in and through me to make me an instrument of peace. May violence, Lord God, not be in my reach of responses to these conditions that overwhelm us. May we not depend on the mechanisms of death and destruction to create, Lord God, harmony and unity among us. But as I stand with my arms lifted to you, may we, I be reminded that the way you chose to save was to surrender, was to sacrifice. To sacrifice, Lord, so we would have the ability to reach for the peace. So God, we're reaching for it right now. God, I need peace in my family. Come on, reach up and grab it. I need peace on my job. Come on, reach up and grab it. I need peace in my heart and peace in my mind. I need the deception of darkness to fall from the scales of my eyes. I need you, God, to just remind me that power comes from you and that power can make me a peacemaker in a world of war. And we'll say thank you, God. We'll say thank you, God. We'll say thank you, Lord, for making us instruments of your peace. Peace like no other reaches to me. Can you put the put the slide of Francis' prayer back on? And I'd like for us to read this together. Peace like no other. I know it may be small, so some of you got good eyes. But I want this to be the way we close out our time of prayer. Let's all read together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Here we go together. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And I'll read the last line, because y'all can't see it. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. If you're committed to at least attempting to live that out, take the sign that is on your chair and this will be our joint altar call together. And I want you to lift that sign over your head. We're gonna take a picture. Many of us are doing this all across the country. Lift it over your head as high as you can and or maybe stagger it a little bit better. If, you, if you're in the front, bring it down a little bit. If you're in the middle, bring it up a little more. And if you're in the back, put it all the way as high as you can. Yes. Peace like no other. Y'all can fill in the middle aisle. Come on, y'all can fill in this middle aisle. Peace like no other. Reaches to me. Reaches to me. You 
you are my peace you, you are my, my peace. peace peace like no other peace like no other peace like no other peace like no other. 